Whatever happens and however Satan may buffet, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has died for us and that Christ has risen and so it's well with my soul. Yesterday, uh, with this, yesterday with this Bible from this pulpit, uh, I preached a sermon but this table wasn't here. It was moved over to the side because there was a casket here. It was a funeral for our friend Mary Colbert. And it is in Christ that we say, Lord, haste the day when the living join the dead and we're all with Christ forever. No matter what happens, it's well with our soul if we have Jesus and we have that assurance of salvation. Let's pray together. Lord, haste the day when our faith shall be sight. Lord, we are hastening toward that great day when earthly pleasures and pursuits will all appear to be vanity. It will not matter on that great day whether we were rich or poor, admired or despised, healthy or sick. But on that day, it will matter. Did we mourn over our sin? Did we hunger and thirst for righteousness and did we cry out from the soul Lord Jesus have mercy on me a sinner spirit of God in this moment set our minds hearts and wills on that day for you Jesus amen this morning I'd ask you to turn to Luke chapter 11 Luke chapter 11, verses 33 through 36 will be our focus this morning. Luke chapter 11, verses 33 and 36. Uh, today, I'll give you a New Year's challenge here from this text. And uh, next Sunday, I asked Wayne to give the congregation a New Year's challenge uh, from uh, the Word of God and from his heart. And then uh, the week after that, uh, Lord willing, I'll preach on our vision as a church for making trained disciples and introduce the, the capital campaign and the focus that we're going to have um, to expand our facility this year. And then the week after that, we'll start our new uh, expository series, which will be from the book of James. We'll start that on January uh, 26, Lord willing. But today, as a New Year's challenge, my my uh, eyes are drawn to this text about your eye in Luke 11. Look at verses 33 through 36. No one lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. Your eye is the light of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no dark part, it will be wholly bright as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. It says there in verse 34, your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. The old King James Version says there, if thine eye is single. Decent translation of the Greek word there is healthy. That's more of an explanation. The word is actually that word, single. If thine eye is single. The ESV translates it healthy. The NASB translates it clear. But it is a very arresting image. The image is that light could be all around you but you won't see or benefit from any of it if your eye is unhealthy or clouded or misfocused God's love God's love may be all around you but you won't experience it if your heart is hard and not single for God. God's wisdom, God's wisdom 
is available all around you this year. God's wisdom is available for you right now and for the whole year ahead, but you won't benefit from it at all. You won't know anything about it if your head is foolish and misfocused instead of single and focused on the Lord Jesus. Well, let's look at the chapter here and uh, help you understand what this arresting image means in Luke 11. Come back to Luke, uh, come back to Luke, start in verse 14. And I'll show you just a little bit of what I think he's, what I, where I think he's going in this narrative and in this description in verse 34 of the eye being single. Starting back in verse 14, it says, now Jesus was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the people marveled. Some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, while others to test him kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. This, this, this sets up everything else that happens in the next three paragraphs, including this image about the eye. So if you look with me there in verse 14, Jesus does this miracle. He casts out this demon. And then right away in verse 14 and 15 and 16, there are three reactions to the miracle that Jesus performs. Three ways that we can see if people see it or if they don't. The first one is there in verse 14, it says the people marveled. That's the first reaction. Maybe you marvel at Jesus. The next reaction, this one's kind of bad in verse 15, is that you look at Jesus and you say Jesus does everything he does by the power of Satan. And then verse 16 is the third reaction. Jesus does something, but you keep seeking for more signs. Those are the three reactions. Some people marvel. Some people mistake Jesus actually for Satan. And some people keep seeking a sign from Jesus. And then I think Jesus actually answers all three of those in the run-up to our text. You'll see in verses 17 through 26, he immediately deals with this charge that he's doing what he does from the prince of demons. He says in verse 17, but he knowing their thoughts said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do, you, do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast them out, that I cast out the demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. This is what you should see with your eye, that the kingdom of God has come upon you. He says in verse 21, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through the waterless places seeking rest. And finds Finding none, it says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and in order. And then it goes to bring seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. Jesus is simply saying here something pretty obvious. Hey, I'm not operating by the power of Satan. He says, I'm not a deceiver like the rest of you. He says, I'm not doing something so that eventually more of Satan's influence can come in seven times worse than it was before. I'm not a deceiver like that. But he's saying, none of you can even see this because your eye isn't single. You're looking at me the wrong way. Then I think he answers the question or the, the, the first response where it said in verse 14, some people marveled at him. I think that's what he gets at in verses 27 and 28. As he did these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and she spoke of his marvelousness. She said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. This is, I think, a response to the people who were marveling at him because the danger here is that you can marvel at Jesus without obeying Jesus. This woman says something spectacular about Jesus, but doesn't do anything with it. You can marvel at Jesus without obeying Jesus. The danger is praising him without obeying him. The danger is being impressed with Jesus 
without pressing into a deeper relationship of discipleship to Jesus. Is that a danger for you this year? Being impressed with Jesus without pressing into deeper obedience to him. Essentially, what verses 27 and 28 say, which is true, is that motherhood is a blessing. Motherhood is a blessing. So certainly, to be the mother of Jesus, the Messiah, would be an exceeding blessing. But Jesus actually says in verse 28 that hearing and keeping the word of God is a greater blessing than bearing and nursing the Messiah. That's stunning. Jesus says something that you all can do, which is essentially the point of this sermon as a New Year's challenge is to exhort you to hear and meditate on and keep the word of God. And Jesus says that's even more blessed than bearing and nursing the Messiah. You can do that if your eye is single. There were three responses. Some said he did it by the power of Satan. Then, like this woman, they marveled at him but didn't really follow him. And then, obviously, he deals with the sign in verses 29 through 32. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It's seeking for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to his generation. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. This is the danger of the sign seekers. The danger of seeing a sign, but not repenting. He says that the men of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. The danger is seeing without repenting. Seeing without that look transforming the heart. Jonah was, of course, a living demonstration of salvation. He himself was saved from the sea, and then he preached this message of salvation. Then he even mentions the queen of Sheba, seeing the wisdom of Solomon, and Jesus basically says here the people of Nineveh, and Sheba, or Ethiopia, Nineveh, Ethiopia, neither of which is Israel, both of whom are Gentiles, Jesus says, they saw and they repented. They got it. The truth of God's salvation came through. And Jesus is saying there's such a danger here that you all have the Messiah right in front of you, but your eye isn't seeing him. So verse 33, I don't think at all is a change of subject. I think it's the same exact subject. Jesus is saying, here's the light. You are marveling and you are impressed about it. And you, uh, in our language, we would say, you come to church and there are moments while you're sitting in church when you start to wish that your life was more in accord with Jesus. But do you really see are you really listening? And that's my challenge. That's our challenge for the year 2020 is will you have a single eye so that, uh, so, so that what we do as a church really does influence and impact you? Will you have a single eye so that in a couple of weeks when from this pulpit we start our expository study of James, It'll change the way you spend money, the way you speak, the way you love. So that in our ABFs this year, as you go through the book of Acts, that wonderful narrative of a church set on fire by the Spirit of God, that it'll change your boldness and your compassion with which you live in this community. Jesus calls us to have a single eye. Verse 34, the eye is the lamp of the body. When your eye is single or healthy, your whole body's full of light. But if it's bad, your body is full of darkness. Jesus is the light, but do you have an eye that can see the light? How we see is determined by the singularity of the focus of our eye. There may be something to see, but if our eye is not singularly focused on it, we won't see it. How we see 
is determined by the focus of the eye. Let me say it this way. Spiritually here, what he's saying is that what turns the focus of the eye is love. Let me show you that. Love focuses the eye. In this context, another word for love is the word loyalty. Loyalty focuses the eye. Love focuses the eye on Jesus and love, loyalty focuses the eye on Jesus. Lust is a distraction that makes the eye wander. A simple illustration would be a man's single eye for his wife. If a man has a wandering eye and every day he's looking at dozens of other women, how could he, have a, how could he say to his wife, I have a single eye for you? Well, Jesus is saying, do you have an eye that is healthy and singularly focused upon me? Will you have this kind of eye in the year 2020? Will love focus your eye? Will loyalty enlighten the focus of your eye? Do you want a single eye for Jesus in 2020? What can you do to have a single eye, a loyal heart this year? That's the image. That's the big idea. Now it simply remains for me to give you uh, maybe three principles of wisdom in, in how we can have this kind of eye. Number one, make choices with wisdom. Grab the discernment that God gives. Number one, make choices with wisdom. Grab the discernment that God gives. Sometimes we sit in church and part of us wants to know Jesus better, walk with Jesus closer. But how does that wish get translated into action? A year from now, would you like to look back on this year? This is, this is an easy question. A year from now, would you like to look back on this year and uh, be happy about how you ate right and exercised regularly? Well, of course you would, unless you personally want to become Jabba the Hutt. I mean, of course you would. A year from now, do you want to look back on this year and say, I'm happy with what my eye was focused on in 2020? That's what I'm asking you today. A year from now, you want to look back and say, I'm happy with what the eye of my heart was focused on this year. Now, when I say, do you, do you want to look back on this year and be happy with the way you ate and exercised? Or do you want to look back on this year and be happy with what your heart loved? Of course, we all say yes. We want that. We wish for that. We want that. Well, this is, this is it, isn't it? What is the gap between wanting that and actually having it a year from now. It's to make choices with wisdom to, that the discernment that God gives actually directs the steps of your path. That's the difference maker. Set your heart on wanting the right thing and only God can set your heart on wanting the right thing and then walk with discernment toward the right thing and only God can show you how to do that. We're all creatures of habit. You're going to you're going to live uh, this year with, with habits. And it's also true that, that discipleship to Jesus Christ can give you new habits. This is great. This is great news. Discipleship to Jesus Christ can give you new habits. You know, Ephesians 5, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time. Why not redeem the time better in 2020 than you did in 2019? Why not change your habits and your habit of spending time on this or that or the other thing to think about the loyalty of love that focuses the heart on Jesus and have a new habit of serving Jesus in some way in the church or in the community or of studying Jesus and his love in some way by joining a Bible study or going through a book with a, with a good Christian friend. We want to cultivate these new habits. We want to make choices with wisdom 
and grab the discernment that God gives. And right along with this, in overcoming that gap between wishing and actually having, not only do we have to make choices with wisdom, but the second principle I'd give you is this, act on wise choices with self-control. Act on wise choices with self-control. That is, get the discipline that God's Spirit gives. Get the discipline that God's Spirit gives. Act on wise choices with self-control. Get the discipline that God's Spirit gives. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. That gap between wishes and reality, that gap between wanting and actually having, is, is largely bridged by this matter of acting on godly choices with self-control and getting the discipline that the Spirit of God gives. The key to self-control is self-discipline where our choices uh, are no longer, this is, you know, we all think we know what self-control is. Self-control is, it's kind of trippy when you think about it. It's like a mirror in a mirror in a mirror. Self-control is not just when you yourself does whatever you feel like. Self-control is when the old self is yielded to the Spirit of God. And so spirit control and self-control are interrelated because godly self-control is yielding the self to the Holy Spirit of God. That's why self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. Godly self-control is yielding the self to the Holy Spirit of God. And when we have an eye for Jesus... He actually transforms us so the new self becomes the self that is filled with the Spirit of God. Act on those choices with self-control and get into the discipline that God's Spirit gives. How do we cultivate self-control? Well, the fruit of the Spirit. So we ask God for help. Say, send me the fullness of the Holy Spirit. How do we receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit? I'd say, repent of sin. I'd say, meditate on the word of God. Ephesians 5.18 is paralleled by Colossians 3.16, which says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Repent of sin, meditate on the word, memorize the word. Another good help to self-control in most of our lives is an accountability relationship. I understand that you are a person who's just invisibly accountable to the Trinity. I just don't trust you. You, you need another person that you're accountable to. You know, there's these accountability relationships. Ask a godly friend for accountability. I've often told a friend, you know, um, for the next, whatever, 10 days, I want to pray for an hour a day. Ask me 10 days from now if I did it or not. You know, just get a little bit of accountability. The other thing is to regularly stop and evaluate and consider your ways. Too many of us just don't ever question our habits. We just live one week the same way that we lived last week. You gotta put somewhere in your put somewhere in your life a time to stop and consider where did my time, where did my love, where did my loyalty go in the last 14 days? And is that where I wanted it to go? P- build in those times of journaling and self-reflection. It's such a healthy spiritual practice. Take control of what you turn on and what you turn off. And when you fail, don't quit too early. You know what self-control is? Self-control is not quitting the first, second, third, fourth, fifth time you fail. Too many of you give up way too easily, way too easily. I would dare to guess that even, even now, you're like, yeah, I've heard a New Year's message about having a quiet time before and I tried that eight times and it didn't work. Don't quit. Self-control believes what the Spirit of God says over what the self narrates about its own past. That is self-control. Don't quit too early. Don't let your failure freeze you out of what the Spirit of God has for you when he makes things new. And make more disciplined choices about uh, what you turn on and what you turn off. to To give you two words, the vile... And uh, just the vain or the, the bad and the neutral, t- 
turn off everything that's vile. If you're, if you're being entertained by things that are pornographic, you've got to get rid of that immediately. Of course you need to turn away from the vile. But then you also need to turn away from that which is vain and just sort of empty and useless. Maybe it's a hobby that's not morally impure, but you know that it just takes too much of your heart. It takes too much of your loyalty, and so you've got to limit it somehow. I'm just saying consider that and, con- and consider that and be careful about it. So make choices from wisdom and grab the discernment that God gives and then act on those choices with self-control. Get the discipline that God's Spirit gives. Let me give you a third challenge and hopefully a help for this new year. And it's simply this. Focus your vision on what you value most because you're going to become what you behold. Focus your vision on what you value most because you're going to become what you behold. If I was a decent modern preacher, I would have that up on the screen, but of course I don't, so I'll say it one more time. Focus your vision on what you value most because you're going to become what you behold. Or to say it in a positive way, get out there and behold what you wish to become. Behold what you wish to become. Behold Christ so that you can become more Christ-like. Or focus your vision in 2020 on that which is vain and immoral. And I know where you'll end up at the end of the year. Focus your vision on what you value because you're going to become like what you behold. You understand this biblical principle from Psalm 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked or stands in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of scoffers. He turns away from what's vile and what's vain, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. And so the man of God, the woman of God becomes like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and in all that he does he prospers. Psalm 1 verses 1 through 3. You understand this principle from Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world. Everything that's vile and everything that's vain don't be conformed to it. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You understand this principle from 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to the next. That 2 Corinthians 3.18 is one of the places where we get that you, you become what you behold. While we behold the glory of Christ, we're transformed into that same image. This is, this is what it's about. To behold Christ in all of his beauty. One of my, I just uh, last week pulled back out one of my favorite very old books about preaching. And one of the things that book says about preaching is this. You ever thought about this? The goal of preaching is not only to devote the will to the purpose of God. That is, my goal in preaching to you is not only that you would devote your will to the purpose of God but also to purge the imagination by the beauty of God. I love that. The goal of preaching is not only to devote the will to the purpose of God, but also to purge the imagination with the beauty of God. Place your vision on what you value because you're going to become like what you behold. Romans 12 says there are two alternatives. And there's not a neutral position between the two. You actively and aggressively get transformed by the beauty of Christ or the world and your own sinful flesh within actively and aggressively conforms you to the malformation of the world. If you absorb the world constantly and sprinkle a little Jesus here and there, the world will seem normal to you and Jesus will seem weird. 
If you absorb Jesus constantly, then the world will begin to appear to you the strange, disfigured, temporary, dusty thing that it actually is. But if you take in the world without thinking, then everything about the Bible and Jesus is just going to seem weird and unattainable. But if you take in Jesus and his gospel, then the world will become strangely unattractive. I'm like at the back end of the Apostle John when he says, don't love the world. I want to exhort you not to love the world, but I actually think on the front end, my job is to purge your imagination with the beauty of God so that you become people whose love is so fixed upon God that there's not love left for the vile things of the world. Will you do that this year? Will you do that this year? Will you be shaped by the spirit of the living God? So I know there are some of you and I, I, uh, I don't mean to pick a fight with you in the sense that I want you to fight back at me. I just mean to wail on you and for you to be quiet, okay? That's where I'm going with this. I, I, know, I, know, I know some of you, you know, it's like, what do, what do I have to turn off? Well, some of you are just news junkies, like... It's important to stay informed and you should vote, but four hours of news input a day is too much. Whatever the news is about, it ain't gonna last forever. Like, do you, do you want the values of your imagination to be shaped by whatever line producer that works for Fox News Corporation decides to bump to the open because they have the best video about it? Don't, don't let that happen to you. Let your vision and your values be fixed on Jesus. For some of you, it's not news. It's just, you know, Netflix and entertainment. Well, again, do you want the shape of your heart to, to actually be transformed by whatever the algorithm of Netflix decides to autoplay next because your lazy self can't even hit the button to stop it? Or do you want the vision of your heart to be formed by Jesus? And there's also someone out there that I haven't even picked a fight with yet because you're not a news junkie and you don't even have Netflix. Well, I could, I could make you upset too. <laughs> with simply this statement, uh, so it's not media. Uh, if it's, the, if it's you just thinking about life and yourself and everything that happened to you, that's unhealthy too because you're not your own shepherd. You're not your own guide. And your mind and your heart, like my mind and my heart, are deceptive. The last person who can fairly evaluate Spencer is Spencer. I need the spirit of the living God to scrub me inside every day and, and, and just peel that, that, that self-deception that seems to grow back overnight. I need him to peel that out. That's why I need to be in the word of God, not just tip in my own head. Love focuses the eye on Jesus and beholds his beauty. This is one more sermon on having that time in prayer and time in the word. And I know you've heard me preach this sermon before. And I resolutely, steadfastly refuse to apologize for preaching it to you again. I will stop preaching it when you quit neglecting it. And that's never. But, you know, hear the message and hear this. This is an exhortational sermon for you to get into the word and get in prayer and turn away from the things of the world that distract you. But hear this. I'm asking you to get to work on your relationship with Christ. The gospel says that we, we the gospel says that if you are working to get in to God's favor, you're far from God. The gospel is that Jesus did all of the work in our place. And now that we are secure in him, we don't work for his favor, we work from his favor.
This is salvation by grace through faith. And now we have these good works that he's ordained for us to do. But they're not meritorious, just so much as they're spiritually healthy as those who have been redeemed by Jesus. Abide in Jesus. Love him. Get his discernment. Get the discipline that his spirit gives. And behold Jesus this year. Let love focus the eye of your heart so that you have a new identity. Identity is organic and it's actual and it grows. That's why I love, 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 love the image from Psalm 1. You be a tree, not a not just a, a parrot and not some sort of painted picture. You'll be a tree. Nothing will be artificial about your spirituality. Nothing will be fake or hurried about your spirituality. You ever try to hurry up a tree's growth? It ain't gonna happen. It grows inevitably out of the soil and out of the conditions of the life. This is what I love about the church. You can be becoming more Christ-like and I can be becoming more Christ-like and yet the two of us are almost like totally different but we're both becoming more Christ-like because, because the tree takes in the soil and it grows in its own setting so that in whatever it does, it prospers. Your choices flow from your character and your choices accumulate to build your character and so you're always becoming who you're going to be. Who do you want to be in 2020? We have a single eye on Jesus because his love saves us his blood saves us. And so our response to his grace is to look on him with love. Let loyalty and love give you a single eye for Christ this year. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we... If you keep our heart beating, Lord Jesus, we will leave from this place and make so many choices this year. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would so transform our character within that the choices that we make would be authentically different and uniquely Christ-like in our own situation and circumstance. Lord Jesus, make us healthy from within a single eye, a loyal heart, a growing fruitful tree in the year ahead. This we ask, Jesus, that you might be glorified in your church. Amen. And so now, church, this year, church, this year, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord, the Lord God, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.